I leave uh, the floor to Xavier Ploquin. Uh, he will give us uh, uh, the view uh, on uh, this issue of energy and, uh, and uh, environment and sustainable development. Uh, the point of view of the of uh, the financial uh, of uh, the financial institution uh, is uh, investment director and chief of staff uh, uh, to the CEO of Meridian, which is an investment company uh, specialized in sustainable infrastructure. So, sh seven minutes, no more. So, hi everyone. I also have a presentation that's way too long. So the good news is that I can pick and choose and I will actually talk just a little about financing because I had my advertising page about investment in the battery giga factories. But I had a quite long introduction that actually echoes, I think, a little, maybe in a biased way, uh, the speech of my neighbor. Uh, because I wanted to start and to have a focus on my view because uh, Meridium is a global infra fund developing long-term infrastructure. I personally also used to be an uh, energy advisor for the French Ministry of Energy, and I had to plan uh, energy in France, so I wanted to share a view that led, in the end, to the financing part, but since I will make it short, I will try to just maybe share uh, something about what I think is interesting for European strategy for uh, climate uh, adaptation and mitigation betting on resilience, adaptation, and sovereignty. The two first words being words that you don't hear everywhere, and the third one that we use not to hear, but that we hear now. Ah, the presentation is coming back. So maybe just the first point is that, in my view, and I agree with what you said, Europe is actually the part of the world that's benefiting the most from the energy transition. Why? Because I think everything has been stated and uh, explained in the other presentation, there is a lot of text. So maybe if we focus just on the big blocks, just to remember that Europe imports massive amount of oil, gas, and coal. 93% of our oil, 89% of gas, 25% of coal, and it's not going to increase. Um, we are fully dependent on all the raw materials, uh, lithium, 100%, cobalt, 81%, nickel, uranium. Um, and in addition to that, it is very concentrated. The third point is that we have some manufacturing capacities, and we have important one in heat pump, for instance. We are global leaders. We are still leaders in wind, although the position is challenged. We are tech leaders in H2, even though the production is starting to grow in China. And we are leader in nuclear, even though uh, our industry had had some difficulties and they are now recovering. Uh, but some important parts of the value chain are missing. Battery manufacturing, as I said, we have, in, we, we have invested, so I hope it will change, and PV production, which is close to zero. Let's not talk about food, because I want to talk about food, but I've cut the, the slides. But, and maybe there are just some elements that are important, but everything has been said already. Stated policy scenario from the International Energy Agency, oil, keeps approximately at 100 million barrels per day. So it means it will remain a big commodity, it will remain something with price volatility and something that has a, an impact on our global balance. But what you can see on the right is that developed countries should reduce their consumption. And they are supposed to. Maybe we will grow other kind of dependency we have not talked about hydrogen today, actually, because it's still something that's kind of science fiction. But if you project over 30 years, European Union is supposed to be a completely different from the rest of the world, importing mass of hydrogen, according to the IEA. Will it happen? Will it not? Anyway, it's just a substitution from a dependency to another one. And what's interesting is that in Europe, well, this is about metal, but I think we have all understood that we are basically fully dependent, that the dependency will grow. We'll need to expand the importation of lithium by like 18 times before 2030. 
and 50 times by 2050. So it is huge amounts. This is about PV, I will skip also. And I think we have seen nearly exactly the same, uh, the same chart, uh, Olivier, but yours one about inflation. This one is about the share of the GDP that, that has been used for energy. And what you can see is that we are exactly in the same situation as it was in the first two energy crises, uh, which is very huge. And what happened in Europe is that we have completely socialized this with a tariff shield uh, that increased the, the debt in, in France, for instance, 2.5 points, um, which means that uh, this is something that has a huge impact on our capacity to develop in the, to develop in the future. So the, con the consequence of the first part of my presentation was to state that, and I agree with you, when we think about energy transition, it's something that benefits Europe the most because we are by far the most dependent part of the world. Many parts are, depend uh, are dependent on energy imports, but we have the largest share for the moment, I think. What's interesting is that European countries could be considered rich enough to transition, and that's also the reason why they can push for that. But the weight of the transition is actually weighting very much on the households in Europe, and they have trouble facing that. So this chart is just to, to mention that if we want to target net zero and not stated policy, we have to find approximately 1 trillion euros in advanced economies uh, to invest starting in the next three years. So it is huge. And what's interesting is that over the long term, the total energy cost of a net zero scenario is supposed to be lower than something that's the stated policy. But the problem is that it requires massive investment. So that's why in the end I was supposed to talk about investment funds. Um, and the, the, what everything should have in mind, because I think that in, in these chambers we do not talk about households, we do not talk about the, the people enough, is that a study has been done in France about the cost of house renovation or about EV uh, electric vehicle acquisition. When you, uh, once you take off the subsidies, how many years of salary it costs to a household. So the households are from left to right from the first decile, meaning the 10% less rich on the right, the 10% more rich. And what you can see is that basically a, reno a complete renovation of your household if you're in the 50% uh, less rich people in France, in France, after subsidies that can go up to 70% of the cost, still will cost you approximately two years of salary which is something that you cannot afford, and the return on your investment is not enough, or you need to have like very long-term debt. It is a bit better on electric vehicle, but what is important to understand is that European households, even though they are supposed to afford and to desire climate mitigation, do not find the value today. And frankly, even though you think it, it is a religion, I think that most of the European households, they, they do not really care enough about climate mitigation to, pay, to spend two, three, five years of salary to renovate their house if they are told that it is for climate reasons. Can we agree that they are not I, th I think that European households, they are not ready to pay, let's say, five years of... Uh, of not, not ready. No, I think they are not at all. And bad news, so this is about hydrogen, but that's a figure. Bad news, you could think that debt was a good way to upfront the capex and pay over time. But this graph, I think, is one of the most insightful ones I've seen in years. So even if it's about hydrogen, it is why I've put that here. In 2021, if the cost base for a hydrogen project was 100%, in 2023, it's 150%. Much, m most part of the increase in cost is the cost of capital. Cost of debt has exploded. Debt is less available. And it's the same for every part of the energy transition. So the households that could finance their renovation by having 30 years debt at 0% cannot anymore. And this, is, and this will have a huge impact on European households. 
So I will just use two slides and nearly not talk about financing. My conclusion about the, the European households is that the new solutions, the green new solutions are more costly than they, th they are supposed to. Because even if they are less costly than fossil fuel solutions, they are not when you compare to the fact that people are already equipped with existing fossil solutions. So they need not only to invest new capex, but to write down basically the one that they previously had. And people know that. And solutions that rely on, let's say, carbon taxation, they don't have the right time pace. Because you change your car every 10 years, you renovate your house every 20 or 30 years, but you pay your bill every month. So this is not an incentive that people are ready to accept. P green solutions, even in Europe, are not perceived as good ones. Because sometimes they are too expensive, you know, just the same thing, more expensive. Sometimes it less, it's more expensive and you have doubt about the fact that it works. There is a huge debate in France, in Germany, about heat pumps. Do heat pumps really work when it's minus five degrees? And this is really hard to target. And it is not a geopolitical high level discussion, but it's something that basically prevents people from buying heat pumps instead of, I don't know, gas boiler. And third, sometimes the solutions are expensive and they do not give the same service. Electric vehicle, for instance, they do not have the same capacity as a uh, regular uh, gasoline car. So it is very hard to convince people and they perceive that the value is outside. In Europe, they perceive that if they buy PV, they buy Chinese thing. If they buy uh, EV, uh, they buy, Chi it's often Chinese, huh, basically. They buy uh, foreign uh, products and that, did, that, does not, that does not create jobs and it creates dependency. And finally, as I said, the financing capacity is completely down at the moment because the debt is higher, inflation has struck, and in Europe, people need most of their cash to buy expensive housing, expensive studies in some countries, so they don't have that much room for additional expenses. Would you conclude and the conclusion one minute? about this part, and it's in one minute, was that I think that a good way of probably discussing energy transition, and it will involve also the southern countries, is to focus on resilience, adaptation, and sovereignty. IPCC, for instance, showed a graph. That's the most interesting graph, I thought. We will not detail. It is one of the fact that most of the climate adaptation strategies, they also have benefit on mitigation. People are ready to accept adaptation measures because it will give them more value for money. It will protect them from heat wave. It will protect them for lack of energy for grid dependency. They will be ready to pay. Maybe Western countries should be able to focus on this kind of strategy that give basically the households value for money and to discuss with other countries how to phase out the more uh, polluting uh, fossil fuel, but not be completely focused on mitigation because I think it's not acceptable in Western parts of the world either at the moment. And I have not had the, to the time to talk about gigafactories of battery, but I, ca I can around the cocktail if you want. Okay, thank you. Uh, you uh, Sorry, I, I fully okay. support what you said about uh, adaptation. Uh, in, I remind you that in K Kyoto Protocol, adaptation and mitigation were, tre were treated the same way. But unfortunately, unfortunately, COP after COP, adaptation totally disappeared. Uh, it came back recently, and I think it will be very important for COP28 to increase the uh, consciousness and uh, the, the, uh, the consciousness on adaptation.